Should we, Malsa, should we have one more minute before we start? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think let people to join in and we can start in another uh, maybe a couple of minutes. We'll start at three or five. Okay. So we have five minutes uh, for people to join in grace period to settle themselves before their computer and ensure that they have their cup of tea or in a coffee with them for uh, listening to the lecture and keeping them ready for the questions and queries and clarifications, if any. Yeah. Good afternoon, dear participants. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar, which is a very important one. And uh, this is the third in uh, this year in terms of uh, uh, sustainability and in transport sector. We had a seminar or rather, uh, you know, full day workshop and it was, uh, you know, multi-stakeholder workshop in Kolkata organized by our Eastern Regional Center. Uh, in in May second week, and that was on the road safety. Then it was followed by Northern Jones uh, at headquartered in uh, New Delhi. We had uh, multimodal uh, transport network system, including uh, PM Gati Sakti. Now in uh, back in August, now we are doing this on uh, sustainable and affordable uh, transport, making it happen in India, whether it's possible. Uh, quite often you see that, uh, you know, during the Planning Commission National Urban Transport Policy, it was meant to happen for uh, people mobility, not the vehicle uh, mobility. 
but subsequently in implementation somehow somewhere something happened probably thought that uh, uh, one size fit everywhere it didn't really exhibition happen properly and you can see this is a continuous problem in urban areas and uh, in india as you see that uh, the urbanization happening at a very uh, rapid pace and uh, as uh, the the projection says by 2040 you will have almost or maybe 2030 you will have 40 percent of india's total population will be in urban areas cities are uh, already facing tremendous up of pressure uh, due to the uh, movement of people into the city and uh, so that's going to continue by 2050 you can see 50 percent of india's uh, total population which is expected to be around 150 60 you know uh, crores could be around 750 to 800 million people living in cities so that you can see that how situation can you know turn into in terms of uh, uh, urban mobility and making it sustainable making it uh, net zero decarbonization is another big question and looking at also climate i'll just uh, quote to start with a, a small uh, line from lewis mofford who is a very famous uh, it, it talks about the roaring traffic uh, boom he talks that uh, adding highway lanes to deal with the traffic congestion is uh, loosening your belt to cure the obesity it's uh, always like that, uh, you know, I remember when I came to Delhi uh, some 32, 32 years ago, I saw only few flyovers, handful of flyovers uh, that was constructed just after the 1982 uh, SCR Games. And uh, now we come to Delhi. Delhi, in fact, is one of the, uh, the highest density-wise, road density-wise city in the world. Still, we face a lot of traffic jam. And that's not in Delhi because all uh, national capital region and Delhi. So that's the effect of uh, urbanization, economic growth. And uh, what we call is the challenge is called uncontrolled motorization. So we don't have any restrictions. And that you can see it resulted into many, many fold uh, problems. Even if you take out to some of the, you know, the vehicles, the diesel vehicles, 10 years old, mandatory that you can't fly in the NCR. Uh, that's, uh, that's one step. You have uh, most of the uh, public uh, vehicles are on, on, on the gas, whether CNG and all the uh, natural gas. That's also trying to reduce some of those, uh, 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 what you call uh, the pollution load here. But that's not going to really take you to, uh, take you to the whole uh, uh, the problem solving approach. You got to really look at something which is uh, which can be really uh, you know for specific specific you can't have one size fit into the problem in mumbai problem in delhi or any other city is going to be the same so therefore uh, you got to really work which system works which do not work i think everyone knows that we had a brt in delhi from ambedkar nagar to ito it didn't work i mean why it didn't work nobody really looked at it you keep on adding things it doesn't work Whereas same BRT works quite well in Ahmedabad. You look at uh, metro in Delhi works perfectly okay. Why the metro in Jaipur didn't work? So I think you got to really learn some lessons to make the urban transport, which is not only accountable uh, as per the Niti I work on, but I would say that uh, we need to make it as affordable so that people should keep their vehicle at home and go and they take the public uh, or mass traffic system. But what happened over the years, you know, if you look at the all Asian countries, all cities in Asian countries, we always uh, do not, we still follow this uh, developed countries which they had a, like a vehicle based uh, transport system instead of MRT uh, systems. And that is what we, we still keep doing and all. Up late, they have been trying to really retrofit, do things which is be like, a, you know, for pedestrian, non motorized, uh, they are something for only the. Uh, the motorized transport but still uh, the, the problems are not getting really solved and because of our population because of mindset it do not work so therefore the when you have built more roads you will have more then you will see more cars then more congestion it's a, like a vicious circle and that's going to happen actually you know you know coming days i think to address those issues and to look at uh, how really india should be able to uh, integrate our uh, policies planning land use who maybe it is uh, you know uh, you know integrating land use with the transport planning those things we will need to look at 
And with that also, we have to look at how the urban air pollution. I think everybody knows in the, this part of the northern Delhi, uh, northern India, especially Delhi and NCR, how much we face actually uh, due to this pollution. Uh, looking at all 10 cities, Delhi is one of the top, top 10 polluted cities. Road safety is another factor we need to look at. Then you have to look at all the mobility for urban poor, how they will travel. I think those who will be in South Delhi, my, I go from Saket to CR Park, which is four kilometer, but you will see that any time in the morning and evening time, they will have a two wheelers, they will have cycles, they will have three wheelers, it's packed. Why can't we do this thing? Of course, BIT was there, never worked, never really, nobody really tried to make it happen, actually. I would say that. Mobility for disabled people, senior citizens, I don't think we have something. Looking at energy, because in India, almost 10 to 12 percent of our total energy goes into the, uh, I mean, uh, energy, uh, actually emission, sorry, I'm talking about the CO2 emission, if you look at total emission in India, uh, almost uh, 12 percent, 11, 12 percent, uh, it comes, uh, whether it is uh, greenhouse gas or CO2 and all emission because of transport. And transport also consume more of the energy. So I think that is another aspect we need to look at uh, uh, in, in this uh, webinar. So we are, what we are trying to do, Today, we have a, a very uh, highly accomplished, internationally known uh, uh, you know, person, uh, Mr. Alok Jain, is here with us. He is uh, based out, he's the managing director and CEO of uh, TransConsult uh, Hong Kong. And Alok comes with uh, some 30 years of, uh, over 30 years of experience. And uh, he has been in all, uh, right from the planning, engineering, designing, operating, managing, training, capacity building, bringing technology and innovating, including tra tra tariffs management. So he is in, in the entire life cycle of the transport system of the city urban, uh, uh, urban transport systems. And uh, Alok has been a member of uh, several international associations, including UITP, and he's also a member of uh, IoT, Singapore-based uh, uh, IoT SG connecting and all smart mobility. And uh, he has been uh, into the uh, management advisor consulting across the globe. Uh, he's a very fascinating person towards urban planning. Uh, his basic background uh, from the Ostweil University of Rurki, which is called IIT Rurki as an undergraduate engineering, uh, master's in uh, uh, transport engineering from ACN through technology. Uh, uh, Alok is based out of Hong Kong over the last 30 years. Besides his passion to transport, he does many other things, including his passion for theater. So that is another aspect and some movies also. There will be a, there is a quiz uh, that you have to find out which movie Alok worked and the quiz actually, I'll give you a hint that where Siddharth Basu, the another theater personality also worked there. So keep in mind, Google it, search it and find out. And at the end of the, uh, seminar after Q and A. I'll ask that whoever has got the right answer. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to hand over uh, to Alok. Before I do that, uh, let me just have a small housekeeping. That uh, everyone is uh, welcome to ask questions, uh, and you can put those questions in our chat box. And uh, Mr. Malchab is here, and myself will look at it. And uh, after Alok's presentation, probably 50 to 50 minutes to one hour. Uh, we'll take those questions, uh, you know, and uh, get the responses, uh, the, the answers. And uh, so all uh, mics uh, will be now mute except the speaker. And if someone wants to ask and speak, actually, you can raise hand in the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom uh, bar, and then we can take it up. With this, I welcome uh, say Alok Jain, my dear friend from Hong Kong, uh, for this opportunity to give us to speak to our members uh, of CI, our fraternity, and uh, we're looking forward to hear a lot. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Ajay, and that was really very kind introduction, and, and I think you raised some fantastic points uh, with respect to you know, urban transportation and the things that India or the challenges that India is facing or will be facing in near future. And I think many of these challenges are pertinent worldwide. And before I start uh, talking about India, I'll also just maybe it's worthwhile for me to mention uh, you know, how things are in Hong Kong because it sure. sets a kind of a great context now, 
Hong Kong is uh, considered a very developed city. It's a rich city. The GDP per capita is possibly about 10 times of India. Uh, in Hong and Hong Kong, uh, again, uh, the household incomes can be compared with anywhere in the world, you know, Europe or US or anywhere. And despite that, uh, you know, and so car ownership is really not an issue. People can go and buy the car, you know, it's very affordable in that sense. Yet the ownership of car is one of the lowest in the world, uh, you know, in Hong Kong. And 90% of the daily travel is actually made on public transport here, trains and buses. And, and these systems are fantastic. Uh, I was very uh, privileged and lucky to arrive in Hong Kong at a very young age when I was just 27. Uh, I was right after my finishing my master's and uh, I came here and I was into designing of railways at that time. And we were, we were doing a railway system designs for a lot of number of new metro lines here. And uh, this was the time when Delhi Metro, uh, Mr. Sridharan also brought in his team here in Hong Kong, and we were training them uh, for uh, metro operation. And, uh, and then they went back and built a fantastic system back in Delhi. And then uh, from the engineering side, I had an opportunity to move to railway strategy. Then I moved from strategy to uh, finance. Then I moved to operations and then I moved to marketing. So I kind of moved across uh, various uh, things within the metro operation. Uh, and, and that also allowed me to be at the forefront of a number of planning processes uh, within Hong Kong and make a lot of significant contribution towards the overall development of public transport. And then uh, my, in my second stint, I ran a bus company, which is the largest bus operation in Hong Kong. 4,000 buses carried about 3.2 million people per day. And uh, with a, you know, a, roughly about a strength of about 12,000 bus drivers. So we managed that, that. And my contribution to that was to turn the company around from a loss-making operation to a profit-making operation without you know, firing a single person without reducing any buses. And we just used completely efficiency-based approach, a data-driven uh, decision-making approach to turn the company around. And, and the bus company is still running. It did very well. So we, we moved it from $120 million loss per year to $750 million profit. Now, Hong Kong model is very unique. Uh, here, there is zero subsidy to any mode of transport. The government doesn't put any bill. All the transport operation, they have to be self-sustaining. And public transport competes with each other. So all the public transport companies are actually listed companies and they are operated by different companies. So they are not just all under one umbrella and they compete. So there is a competition for passengers and which means that every operator is actually competing to provide better services, better products, uh, better ticketing framework, and that really makes it a consumer's market. So, you know, for me, when I get step out of my house and if I have to go somewhere, I have multiple transport choices. Uh, I, can, I can use a bus, I can use a train. And, and so there is a choice uh, available to me uh, on that. And there, of course, there's a pricing competition. So I can also decide which one I prefer. Uh, railways uh, are obviously much more reliable. Uh, if, I if I'm running across time, I use the train if I'm, uh, you know, if I have time on my hand and if I want a seat, then the buses are the preferred choice because the seat to capacity ratio of buses is extremely high. Hong Kong also has a distinction of running almost um, 93, 94% of the fleet uh, in Hong Kong is actually double deck buses. These are massive, you know, three XL 25, 26 ton buses, uh, you know, laden weight and can carry up to 130, 140 people, uh, roughly with 90 seats uh, in, in those buses. So these are, you know, fantastic big buses, big heavy beasts, but they are, um, they run extremely well. They carry a lot of people. So during my bus stint, I also became a bus driver. So, you know, for me too, that was a fast learning process. This was my driving, my school for buses. And I, and I went there and I was talking to customers. I was talking to the front line and that allowed me to fast track my learning of the bus operation. And, and, and that was really part of the process. And I, I not, it was not just me. In fact, I encouraged all my managers to also do so 
uh, at least you know a couple of days a week go there do a shift do a run you know just one round trip or two round trip and that allowed them to appreciate what they were planning what are the difficulties at the front end that people are facing and how we can resolve those so we completely turned into a customer oriented bus service and between 2013 to 17 in hong kong there was only one bus company one transport operator which was actually gaining market share which was gaining uh, more passengers and that was just us you know so we in a competitive market we managed to position ourselves in a in a space where we could deliver a reliable predictable safe and comfortable service so this is so it's it's saying that it is not possible i i don't accept that in many places but it is always possible you have to take the right measures you have to put in the right ingredients and it works i am currently working in in india in many places i work very closely with giz i have done recently uh, a big training program with giz on electric bus operation uh, we are also consulting at the moment with world bank in um, in chennai uh, with mtc uh, in in the business transformation of mtc prior to that i have done some assignments in bhubaneswar with krut so so there are and and i think india is uh, the way i in if i make a generalized statement it's a it's really full of opportunities there is just so much that can be done in the field of urban transportation in india uh, which is currently with this car centric policies and this passion uh, about you know owning a car we are really uh, going in a wrong direction so in hong kong for example uh, owning a car as i said is not difficult but keeping a car is very difficult is is very expensive the parking is very expensive um uh, you know and finding a parking spot is very expensive so all of those uh, things no nope, you know it's never sensible to drive your car so if i'm going to urban areas it is you know me my kids and if i tell my children that you you go drive a car all my children are drivable age and if i tell them to drive a car they all refuse nobody wants to drive here you know because you go to the train and then you are just you you can look at your phone you can be productive you can reply to your email and you can literally guarantee your door to door time so everybody just uses buses and trains so 90% of the daily travel is actually made on public transport and you know it's a it's a, the, um, as per the uh, uh, you know as per about the roads that road space that we have only 13% of the urban area is actually allocated to road space which is among the lowest in the world and and still hong kong as an economy functions fantastically well mobility is not an issue at all and i think this is this is really the kind of uh, systems that india needs because our cities are heavily populated they are very big cities and getting from one place to another if you are driving it creates a lot of issues i mean the issues are not just related to uh, you know congestion but it's a you know driver safety issue passenger safety issue road safety issue vehicle safety issues there are number of things the whole you know uh, magnitude of those is enormous and i think that's why india needs to move towards moving people rather than moving vehicles and and there are certain very good things which are already there in indian transport system and i think what we need to do as planners and engineers is to preserve those and and make sure that we don't lose them out in this rat race or mad race for the for the owning a personal car or a personal vehicle so with that uh, introduction i would i would jump into my presentation if you give me a moment to share my screen so today's uh, presentation is uh, about uh, you know how we can make urban transportation affordable and sustainable in indian context so i'll focus a lot on indian context but uh, you know as i just said earlier in in the introduction uh, you know there are a lot of things happening in different parts of the world there's a lot of innovation disruption that is happening and feel free to ask uh, you know anything if th that you would like to ask i can uh, i mean i i also work in technology area we do artificial intelligence machine learning we do blockchain related solutions for public transport so you know you you can you feel free to just put any range of questions that you have in mind okay so with that uh, you know let me just begin this 
So a quick introduction, although, uh, you know, Ajay has given a very glowing introduction about me. So I'll, I'll just maybe add that I also serve as a member of the Council for Decarbonizing Transport in Asia. Now, this is an initiative which is funded by the German Ministry of Environment. And the purpose for us uh, is to work with the policymakers across countries within Asia to institute policies and address the blind spots uh, where we can, which are hindering the decarbonization work. And, and I'll come to that in a minute, why decarbonization is so important at the moment, uh, it, both in the context of climate change, which is the bigger global agenda, as well as the local context, the air quality, you know, what we breathe, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, which has a significant cost to our health, public health, and, and also the noise that we create within the urban environments and how these efforts to decarbonize can actually address some of these uh, negative impacts that we have within the urban environment. Okay, so as a company, now we, I run a consulting operation based out of Hong Kong. And one of the pledges that we have, uh, you know, as consulting company, that we only do projects which create more, which create sustainable value to, to a city or a client. So we, we don't take any projects that, that, we, that could be detrimental to the local environment or, or the global um, citizenship. So we, we are very focused on public transport, we are focused on uh, non-motorized transport, et cetera. So, we, so every single thing that we do has to meet a certain sustainable development objective, or it has to fall into those ASI framework, the avoid, shift, improve framework that is defined by um, you know, various uh, organizations or as a part of COP26. Okay. So coming to traffic in India. Now, of course, being an Indian, I also have a lot of first-hand experience of the traffic in India. I lived in Mumbai for a couple of years. Uh, I was involved with a number of Indian projects. I, I was involved with the construction of Delhi Airport Express. I did some work with Hyderabad Metro. Um, I also um, you know, was involved with a number of projects in Mumbai at some point of time. So in Mumbai, I used to always joke that if I can have one meeting a day, it's a normal day. If I can have two meetings a day, it's a good day. If I can have three meetings a day, it's a lucky day. And if I have four meetings a day, I should just go and buy a lottery ticket. So this is the situation. And this actually tells a story about the traffic, uh, that how dependable you are uh, in moving around within the city, which is uh, quite ironical because Mumbai, if you look at it, it's a fantastic, beautiful city. It has a fantastic railway network. Uh, of course, getting into that train is a big challenge, uh, and obviously uh, that is not how good quality public transport should run, uh, you know, the kind of loadings that we see on those trains. But having said that, that keeps the city moving. And um, as I just said, I'm, I was interested always in theater. For me, it was always a great thing. My office was in Andheri. I used to take a train uh, to go down to NCPA uh, down south, and then usually uh, you know, um, I would uh, then take, uh, uh, you know, a taxi or something to come back to Pawai where I was living. Uh, but, but having said that, traffic was a daily challenge. And obviously, when it rained or when it was uh, in inclement weather, it became worse. It just became impossible. I, I've been in situations where I literally jumped off a car or a taxi on Western Express, uh, you know, highway and, and walk and run to the airport, to, to Santa Cruz, uh, and to catch a flight. And, and I think that's not abnormal in, 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 if you're living in Mumbai. So that this is not really how a city should be, or, or a city should function. A city should be for everyone. And, and, sh and, and as um, uh, Ajay was mentioning earlier, you know, Indian population, we have to look at the disabled, we have to look at the participation by women. We have to look at, uh, you know, people, aging people who are now going to increase further and further. Uh, Indian uh, population growth rate have just come down below the sustainable level, which means that the number of uh, older people are going to increase slowly. And we are seeing this in China. We are seeing this in Japan, Korea. They are all going through the same cycle 
where number of elderly are, are increasing and, 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 and they require a lot of transport services. And for them, negotiating a, a transport network, which is complex, which is easy, difficult to access is, is a real challenge. So to make sure that we, we provide an inclusive you know, services to our citizens, we need to again, uh, create a you know high affordability and high accessibility to these transport services. So traffic, uh, we all know traffic is a real problem in uh, in, in almost all the Indian cities. Uh, this is a picture I took once in Delhi, and and this is a common sight. Uh, you know, I used to travel uh, in so my home back back home uh, is uh, is Delhi. And whenever I go there, uh, it, it is uh, getting around is a real challenge. And, and especially if you're moving around for a, in a wedding season and you have three weddings to attend in a, in a day, it is, uh, it is a nightmare. So, but, but this is not really how a city should be functioning for anyone. Because as you can see here, people who make the right choice, they are also at danger. You know, somebody who's sitting in a bus who's taking a high capacity, uh, you know, transport system, very efficient transport system, they are also stuck in this traffic stream. And, and obviously people who take inordinate amount of space, uh, which are sitting in the private car, they are obviously uh, stuck in, in this endless uh, stream of traffic. And, and the worst part is it's undependable. You, you just don't know how, when you are going to get released. Now, just imagine in this is a situation. And if somebody in a car has a heart attack, uh, how can an ambulance even reach that person? How can that person be evacuated? How can that life be saved? And it's 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 a it's a huge cost to the society. So that's one. And obviously, people uh, every single car that is stuck in traffic congestion is still emitting something from the tailpipe, and that tailpipe just adds up. And people who are living, and especially kids who are going to the school, uh, people, kids who are who are playing in the parks, they are actually breathing this in, and it is all going to accumulating into the lungs and creating all kind of health impacts to the society. That's really is not something which is desirable. So we need to create a better urban environment within the cities. Unfortunately, this is what happens. You know, everybody who is sitting in the car they think that everybody else should not be driving and, and hence then things will improve. And we all complain about congestion in our cities. And, but yet we, we, when it comes to personal action, we, we don't do it. And, and I am as guilty as, as anybody else. When I uh, you know, land in Delhi, uh, often somebody from the family member, they are driving to the airport to pick me up. And now I have stopped doing that. I always take the train to, to Connaught Place and get picked up at Connaught Place rather than at the airport. So I'm at least saving some 30, 40 kilometers of travel. And the trains are fantastic. The Delhi Metro has done a great job. It is accessible from anywhere to anywhere. I mean, if, if I'm traveling from, let's say, Noida to, to CP, uh, you know, Connaught Place, uh, the best way to travel is on, on Metro. And it's a beautiful uh, system. Um, and, and, and I don't know why it is so underutilized. So original projections for ridership in, in Delhi Metro were extremely high. And, um, and obviously, I mean, um, that is an achievable number, but they were very, very high numbers. But however, the actual numbers that they're getting are, are extremely low as compared to their original projections. And, and that is not just financially, it's creating an impact for Delhi Metro, but that also means that there are people who are out on the street which who should not be there, who should actually be riding the you know, trains and they would have a better journey, they would have a more reliable journey and offer less carbon footprint. Okay, so congestion and public transport has a direct relation. So this is a very, very popular picture. Everybody uses it. And, and uh, so I, I just want to just put it here to show that if, you know, what is the difference between moving about, you know, 70 people, 80 people in, in cars versus a bus, just see the comparison of space that is needed. And, you know, congestion is becoming a worldwide problem. It's not just the India problem and worldwide it is being addressed through what we call push pull factors. So there are two ways to look at it. One is of course, you, you create enough incentives to, for people to change to more, uh, you know, greener form of transport, more sustainable forms of transport. And the second one is to 
to pull, you know, to, to push people uh, is uh, by introducing uh, policies that are, um, you know, that penalize people who use the wrong form of transport. So places like London has this ERP, electronic road pricing. Singapore has uh, COE, you know, they have certificate of entitlement. So if you want to buy a car, uh, the, the certificate to, to go and buy a car, uh, except the cost of the car, could be actually more expensive than the cost of the car itself. So this getting the so they are controlling the number uh, very, very closely and uh, owning a car is an extremely uh, onerous process in places like Singapore. <clears throat> so China has also done now in many, many cities, uh, they have introduced very similar policies, a quota system, and you have to bid for the quota and only the highest bidders can go and get the quota to purchase a car. So, and that is happening in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, um, you know, most of the uh, Chinese, big Chinese cities, uh, they have introduced these policies of restricting the number of cars that can be purchased within the city. Uh, so the stats that we have is that 9% of the uh, driving time worldwide is actually spent in congestion. Now, that leads to obviously a lot of productivity losses, a lot of time that is lost sitting in the in your car where you are being un, where totally unproductive possibly, um, increases the carbon emission obviously. And of course, it creates a big social divide, people with uh, less means of transport or who are relying on things like buses, they are also stuck in that congestion and cannot move. Even though they made a, make a responsible choice, they, they are penalized because of, uh, you know, what we call unequitable uh, use of the road space, okay? So we have to just address this issue uh, in many ways. BRT was possibly one way of doing it. Uh, metros are dedicated right of way, so that is a great way of doing it, but not everywhere you can have the metro. Metros are very expensive uh, transport systems, and if uh, the cost of failure is extremely high. So in India, again, we see that places like Delhi, where it's a fantastic metro system used by a lot of people. And then you also see a number of other cities where the metro systems are highly underutilized and looks like complete waste of uh, you know, money, which can be utilized in many other ways. One thing that I always say uh, to, to cities where I am advising is that I have, you cannot name you know, a city in the world which has a great train system working extremely well and has a poor bus system. So you, you, it's not about being bus or rail. You have to have both bus and rail. And that is the only way it works. Transport is a system approach. You cannot look at one mode of transport and, and say, this is the solution. It's never a solution. You need a package of solution, a basket of solutions to address the transport issues in a city. And that's because we have very diverse needs. People want to travel, you know, five minutes. People want to travel 15 minutes. People want to travel one hour. This whole range completely changes the way we choose our mode of transport. And also why we need to travel also changes. If you are going to office, you know, our preferences are different. If you are going for a social function, it's a, it's a different uh, preferences. If we are going uh, to market, it's a different function. So we actually make very diverse choice choices when we choose transport. And that's why you need to have a package of solutions, a basket of solutions. But yes, if you look at places like London, uh, London has uh, you know great uh, underground metro system. A lot of people use it, but they also have a fantastic bus system. They have 9,500 buses in the city. And, and, and that's the reason why London functions so well uh, on the backbone of public transport. You look at Singapore, uh, they have, uh, you know, fantastic railway system, metro system. They are still constructing a lot of those. And uh, the aim in Singapore is have uh, 75 to 80 percent of the population within walking distance of a railway station. Now, that's a very ambitious goal. But having said that, they have not diluted their delivery of bus system. They are still running about 6,500 buses in Singapore and, and uh, in a city which is currently about, you know, five to 6 million population. So, so bus penetration is still very high. Hong Kong is similar. We have a great railway system, a metro system, one of the 
you know, best cases and examples in the world. A lot of people come here to see how we operate the trains in Hong Kong. And, and you know, a lot of my consulting work also involves that. And, and of course, the train, the metro in Hong Kong is one of my clients now, right now. So, so it's, it's doing a fantastic job uh, with a network of about 200 kilometers. It carries approximately 6 million people a day. You know, that's 60 lakhs. Uh, pe 60 lakh people on a 200 kilometer network every single day. We have stations in Hong Kong that one station carries, you know, 150 to 200,000 people, you know, 1.5 lakh to 2 lakh people in one single station. In many cities, many countries around the world, you, the entire metro system carries that many people. We have we have stations, individual stations that can carry so many people. So it's a it's a great uh, you know, a way to for people to to move around in, in the city. So we need to and and yet uh, going back to my bus story that you still need a good bus system to support this uh, uh, movement of people because uh, so Hong Kong also has great bus system, uh, roughly about you know seven thousand eight thousand buses uh, that we we are running on a daily basis and and uh, there are different choices and of course we have tram we have ferry. We have, um, you know, funicular railway. So there are a number of transport systems. You you name it, and we are running it somewhere in this part of the city. So it's a multimodal solution to the transportation problem uh, in an urban environment. Okay, cost of congestion, as I was saying, is is very high, and and these are just some estimates uh, that has come from other studies. So if you look at the cost of congestion in our Indian cities, and if I just combine these numbers. You know, this, this, these values, you know, uh, if you look at this, this is more than 20 billion US dollars. Uh, and 20 billion US dollar, uh, the cost of congestion that we are losing in our cities. If, if you think that this money can build, uh, you know, metro lines uh, every year, you know, almost every city can be, can have a metro line. 20 billion US dollar is a, is a huge sum of money. I, I don't know, I mean, even if I translate that to Indian rupees, uh, the, the number of zeros going out is is going out of my range of my mental calculations. So it's a it's a big number, big sum uh, for 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 us to waste just in congestion. And as a as a country which is developing, which needs to provide and transport, as we know, is a means of economic growth. It's a it's a economic it's a statement of economic growth in a, in a country. So and a good transportation uh, also gives impetus to uh, you know great, better economy and obviously you know india when it aspires to become a 5 trillion dollar economy or uh, you know one of the largest economies in the world we need to certainly remove these wasteful uh, expenditures that we are doing in our transport system directly or indirectly because these can all be translated into productive uh, you know investments into into the economy some of the facts about India, uh, the GHG emission in India is almost a quarter of the total emissions is actually coming from transport. Now, that's a big, big chunk that, that we need to address. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, it is growing. And as more people are buying cars, more people are buying two-wheelers, we, keep, we keep adding to these, uh, this growth. So we, and as we know, the urgency to reduce the, the GHG in our environment uh, worldwide is is uh, extremely urgent. If we have to meet those even 1.5 degree or 2 degree target around the world, I mean, India just experienced one of the, or, or experiencing one of the, you know, bigger impact of climate change. The summer was pretty bad, uh, you know, in, in India. And even uh, in, U, in Europe, the summer uh, this year had been extremely uh, onerous. Uh, the rivers are drying. Uh, one of the French rivers, Rhine River, uh, is possibly, you know, may go completely, become unnavigable. So it is going to impact a lot of freight movements. Mm, you know, even in this part of the world, in Hong Kong, July was one of the hottest July ever. So th these impacts we can't ignore. And, and this is now a question of our survival as a species, you know, whether, you know, we know the impact it is going to have on coastal communities because of the rising sea level. We know impact it is going to have people who work in outdoor areas. But having said that, the impacts could be even bigger. You know, we can see 
you know, flash floods, we can see typhoons, we can see hurricanes. And, and I think those are even worse. And to control those, we know now the science is telling us that we need to manage the, 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 and the temperature increase uh, of the average in, increase in temperature with, to within 1.5 degree to 2 degrees uh, by 2050 uh, or as India has uh, targeted by 2070, if I recall correctly. So, but we need to set a target and we need to move in that right direction. So, and, and for that, of course, we need to do decarbonization. We need to do electrification. We'll come to that in a minute, but that area needs to be addressed. And one of the easiest way to address is that if we can have our cities where the transport moves uh, you know, smoothly, at least a big segment that is coming out of congestion can be easily uh, removed from, from that GHG emission percentages. Okay, uh, pollution. Uh, and again, uh, India is becoming, um, you know, we have uh, having a distinction that out of the 20 most polluted cities, 14 are now in India. And obviously, we are seeing solutions where people are, uh, you know, installing fans to extract the, the pollution from the air, creating these big filters. I recently saw uh, from Delhi, they have these water guns installed uh, on high rise buildings. But these are uh, you know, as uh, Ajay mentioned, these are buying a new belt for your or buying a new trouser when you get fat. This is not going to address the obesity problem. We need to address the obesity problem. We need to make sure that we don't create a problem in the first place because the cost of those, those kind of fancy solutions is extremely high and the impact is very, very small. So they are not really addressing the problem. They are putting Band-Aid to, to an amputation, you know, when, when you go for a big surgery, uh, you know, you open heart surgery, you're not going to put a bandaid and, and, and say that is done. You need, you know, real solutions. You need real, um, uh, you need to attack the problem. You, you can't just have a bandaid solution. So we have to address these, um, th these problems. Obviously the central figure, uh, which is really uh, something which we all uh, are affected, impacted, because this is, you know, when I am in India, my parents are in India, my, this is what, you know, my cousins, my, my, you know, um, all children, everybody, you know, lives there and they are all affected by this. You know, they are breathing the same air when they talk about asthma, when they talk about, you know, lung problems, when they talk about falling sick or, okay, often all those is cost of health. 2.3 million deaths are linked to air pollution. These are all excess deaths. These are avoidable deaths. And we, we are, have to be responsible. We, we, we can talk about you know, uh, a lot of other fancy solutions, the best car that you want to buy. A uh, lot of those things are making news. How many Mercedes are being sold in India? How many you know, Ferraris are being sold uh, in, in, in India? But that's not really the true picture. This is the cost we are incurring for, for doing those things. And I think we need to address it. We need to move away from uh, you know, polluting vehicles to non-polluting vehicles right away. And of course, uh, when we say people death, of course, that's the grim scenario, but it also has a huge financial implication for a country like India, which is currently struggling to, to go back to the GDP growth that we need to become, uh, need to have to provide employment to people, to provide uh, you know, a sustainable living to people, to make sure that people uh, you know, don't sleep hungry. And so 5.4% of GDP is, is, is coming as a direct impact of the air pollution. So those are certainly areas which, which are all part of this bigger solution that urban transport brings. And obviously, India is a net importer country for oil. And every time we are, we, we are consuming more oil, uh, somebody is putting the bill, it has to, you know, it is coming out of our, um, you know, foreign uh, reserve. So, so that is also a big cost that also creates a lot of dependency of, of the country to other countries. And as you, you see what is happening at the geopolitical level right now, uh, it also kind of creates, you know, geopolitical, um, you know, situations, political situations, which uh, we rather avoid, uh, you know, those dependencies. So a number of those things, that those are obviously not directly transport issues, but they have a very close correlation with what we do at the urban transport level.
So talking about going back, I, I, and I love reflecting back. I, I, I also, when I was growing up, I had opportunities to visit a lot of smaller towns and visit villages. And, 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 and I've seen you know, some of the good things that we have. We Indian cities are still primarily are walking cities, you know. I I I love to walk around and, and you know in, in cities and and of course it's getting worse now. You they are not walkable anymore. But when I and when I was a kid, when I was growing up, uh, I you know I could walk every, almost everywhere. I walked to my school. I came back walking. Uh, you know my grandfather used to take us out to you know on weekends, and we used to walk literally everywhere. And 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 I think that that is something that was fantastic in India, you know, that we need to retain, we need to keep it back. Uh, Non-motorized transport, the bicycles, the rickshaws. Uh, I know we rickshaws, this human drawn rickshaws uh, that we have are not something that we would like to keep, but obviously there are much better solutions. You can have e-rickshaws these days, which are non-polluting, which are still, um, they are motorized, uh, but uh, you know, uh, bicycles uh, uh, in other way. Bicycles are fantastic uh, and they can really move a lot of people. And, you know, we, we are now in this spiral where we are going towards cars. Everybody wants to buy a car that is a symbol of uh, your, um, your success uh, in India. But now the symbol of success in Europe is not car. Uh, it's owning an electric bicycle. So, you know, everybody wants to have a bicycle. I go to Amsterdam. I was actually speaking uh, to the city of Amsterdam. I was running a session for them uh, on, uh, on artificial intelligence, on, on applications of those. And this is precisely the discussions we were having. They are actually having trouble uh, on how to manage bicycles. They, everybody in the city actually uses bicycles. There are cargo bicycles, there are bicycles. So even, uh, you know, the new small babies, they are actually carrying them on bicycles and men, women, old, young, everybody is riding those bicycles. UK, uh, London, uh, the, the number of people who are using bicycles are, is increasing by almost 20% per annum. So it's a huge increase that we are seeing in bicycle usage. And, and India traditionally has used a lot of bicycles, a lot of people daily travel by bicycle. And I think that is again, uh, something that, um, that is a fantastic thing. Uh, it's a, it's a, I would say the whole world is now going back to that and we are getting away from our, uh, you know, walking and bicycling cities. We need to bring them back. We need to, first of all, bring our cities to human scale, the activities to human scale, and then start using non-motorized transport. Uh, animal drawn ca carts, uh, they have um, largely disappeared from most of the cities now, but in rural transport terms, they are still quite uh, prevalent. Uh, they are used, you know, bullock carts, uh, horse drawn, uh, drawn carts, they're still quite common. And I think they, they are part of this bigger, uh, India is, uh, you know, as we you know, used to say that India lives in villages. Uh, that, is, that is part of the transport solution uh, that we need to have. They are slow, yes, but they still serve a significant purpose uh, and create a sustainable mode of transport. So in, in those areas, when you're moving goods, when you're moving uh, you know, your produce, uh, I, I think there is still, they play a you know, very large role in creating uh, part of this sustainable transport mix within the city. So this is again, a data that we picked up from, uh, from census. And as you can see, that uh, you know india is still walking it's a it's a country that walks you know 23% of the people actually make all the journeys on by traveling you know so this is amazing number not many countries in the world can actually claim to have as many people walking uh, and and i think this is something that uh, as as uh, as a country we must preserve walking as a habit walking uh, it's walking is healthy uh, walking is, uh, you know, has no impact on the environment. And walking also means that it creates more lively cities. Have you ever, you know, you go to markets in India, the, the best markets in India are the places where people walk, that, you know, which are, you know, crowded markets where people can walk around. And these are, this is where you get the best deals. This is where you get the best merchandise. And I think and, and that is something we need to we need to scale up. We need to find solutions how we can scale these things 
to a modern uh, you know technology driven or you know data driven culture uh, where we can still preserve the good things but also retain some of these old practices good practices that we have in our cities so as you can see bicycle also contributes a significant portion uh, and much more than any other you know mode of transport but we we can and and these numbers are just fantastic numbers so you know i was recently uh, in a in a presentation where uh, one of the presenters uh, who was from uh, you know he he does uh, some work with adb on asian transport outlook they did a comparison about uh, asian countries and how the number of roads and number of rail, uh, amount of railway percentage of the transport systems as compared to the developed countries and and they basically said that we need to the number of amount of road space in countries like india is much less than what there needs to be and and i complete i disagree with that because i think that's not really the solution i'm not against building roads i'm not against uh, you know creating accessibility uh, but we need to manage what we have first we need to create systems that then grow with these additional infrastructure the infrastructure itself is not the solution the solution is the transport uh, you know that comes with it so we need to find transport solutions and then build infrastructure for that so brt was a was a uh, and i i also don't know why it was a failure in in delhi i have seen br i use brt when i go to istanbul first time i went to istanbul i i i took a taxi from the airport that was my my you know i didn't know the city very well i knew which hotel i was going to and i sat in the taxi and of course uh, you know i was stuck in traffic and as i was stuck in traffic i saw buses just zipping by me you know all the time and one two three you know when 10 buses passed uh, go went past me i asked my driver i said what is this he said oh this is a brt system and and i can tell you from every single trip after that particular trip i have never used a taxi to go to the airport i always use brt uh, or tram or metro uh, in istanbul and it's a great way to to get around you see the city well uh, you are not in in a box you you have more and you can interact with people and you know, locals so it's as a tourist i feel that it's a crime if you don't use public transport because a lot of these uh, value that you want to derive in a in a new place or a new country or a new city is actually comes with interaction with people what you see outside the window how you see people behaving themselves and i think that is a great learning that public transport uh, provides and again one of the things that i mentioned that public transport was the first social media and when i was uh, driving buses in hong kong this is what i realized this is where you actually made eye contact uh you know with everyone you you like people you did not like people you know so you 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 loved certain uh, group of people so as a bus driver i could see that social interaction and for me that was the social media that was the social interaction and and what better way you know where you have a physical face to face contact where you actually greet each other you say good morning thank you whatever you know uh, and 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 that uh, and you know my son used to go to school by bus and every day uh, and he had his favorite drivers and he would say i will take only 820 departure because the driver is nice and and i thought this is really uh, you know an emotional connect that you create he feels my son feels safe he feels welcome just by simple gestures of a bus driver and and you know here in hong kong again uh, you know my when my kids were 8 to 9 years old they were traveling on public transport system by themselves alone and they were going doing their classes they were going doing going for tuitions or whatever and they could travel alone and it was all because the system is so so safe and and so easy to use that even a small child can easily use it and obviously we have this ticketing system called octopus which uh, which gives me a lot of trackability so when my kids go to went to school their school attendance system was on octopus uh, the 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 library the the canteen everything was using an octopus so i never gave cash to my kids so when they went to the school and if let's say uh, you know they were not in the school by quarter to 8 i would get get a email from the school auto generated email 
that your son has not registered for the school system because he hadn't tapped his card. So only when he tapped his card, and then I would call my son and say, hey, you know, can you go tap your card? So he taps his card, he registers in the school system, and I also get a notification that he's safely in the school. So it's whole system of this, this uh, you know, uh, assurance that you create around those and, and combine that with the public transport framework is, 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 is really what gives people a lot of confidence to use the services. So that is what we need to, to create everywhere. Uh, footpaths, as I said, walking and bicycling, they are fantastic mode of transport, but we also see other side of it, you know, where we see a huge amount of encroachment of footpaths for one reason or the other. And, and again, I'm not against the informal economy, and this is really, uh, I think, sustains a lot of people's livelihood. So they, they do not need to be, uh, you know, uprooted, they, but they, they can be designated places for them. Uh, there could be designated spaces for them. They could be part of the footpath, but they should be part of a proper design framework where we allocate street space in such a way which has an equitable use. So it is the street space that we are creating in the cities right now are mostly driven towards a car-oriented movement. So 3.5 meter lanes, and, and you know, we, we do right of way and, and then barely have any footpath. And then we have, you know, mean, we have medians, etc. So it's, we, are, we are putting all these barriers just to keep the car moving smoothly in, in, in one direction. But I think we need to start looking at uh, the whole road space and see whether they can be redesigned to accommodate pedestrians, to accommodate bicycle users, and make sure that from a design perspective, we don't make it easy to, to encroach. We don't make it easy to misuse. And I always use this 4E approach when, when we are doing such kind of design. So one is obviously a big part of it is engineering. So E first E is for engineering. So engineer them well, design them well. The second part is your educate. You know, so you educate people how to use them. Uh, so educate people to not misuse them, both, right? So you, that's the education part. That's the second E. The third E is enforce. So of course, even after the education, you will find people, if you're not enforcing, they will, they will misuse the services. So enforcement is the third E that is equally important. And the fourth E that comes there is evaluate. You need to constantly evaluate what you are doing and then keep repeating this cycle because without a proper evaluation, you cannot support good engineering. So good engineering supported by you know, sufficient education, supported by uh, a no-nonsense enforcement, and then data-driven evaluation. Once you have created this 4E framework in your design and planning uh, for urban infrastructure, you would you would obviously know all this. All the solutions are right there. These are common sense. These are not you know, something coming out of Mars or very innovative that, that we need to learn. I think these were all there in our cities. We have just moved away from these things. And I think we need to bring a lot of these back into our urban infrastructure. So this is an example of Hong Kong. And, and, and I'm showing you, anybody saying something? No, Alok, will you yeah. take another 10 minutes or so? Yes, about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, fine. Yeah. We, uh, so so in you. Hong Kong, th this is a central area, the, the central business district, which is one of the most expensive properties in the world. You know, this is um, really, uh, you know, you, you see a picture of Apple store there, which is right above a railway station. But what I want to, you to see is the picture on the left. And you can see this whole maze of walkways that is created at, uh, it's all buildings are connected. And that connection has been created uh, through, of course, uh, urban planning or land use uh, rules that we have, zoning laws, where the, all the building operators, uh, they have to provide a 24 hour access for people to, to pass through. And that has created a whole pedestrian network. And everybody in Central actually walks from one end to the other. So I can walk literally three kilometers in Central from uh, you know, one end to the other and, and never come out of the street level. I'm walking within buildings, so one building to the other, uh, and you can just find the network there. And it works fantastically. And I think this is a great design for any central business district 
for any cities. And a lot of people, this has been studied uh, by many researchers. Uh, many case studies have been written about it. If you would like to make a search, you, you can easily search it on the internet. But there are a lot of uh, good things here which, which can be learned. Okay. The other thing which is talking about this land use transport inter uh, integration. Now, obviously, uh, you know, your transport hubs, your stations are really the transport hubs where people congregate, where people go. They can, you can also locate your bus station there. So once you have created a, a hub, you can actually create a whole city, you know, urban environment around it. This is an example uh, of uh, one of the train depots in Hong Kong where there's a station in between. So you see the MTR, that is a station and 58,000 people lives in live in this build these buildings that you see around them okay so this is like a small town entirely a town which is sitting above a railway station now i mean it's an obvious guess what most of the people here use on a day to day basis 70% of the people or 70% or of the travel from this development is actually done on the trains right and it's very obvious because it's right there, just below. And there's a shopping mall there. there there's a park. And there are sports facilities. There are schools. Everything is within that that what we call 15 minute, uh, you know, walking zone. So it's a highly walkable, very livable, and very usable uh, space. Uh, you can go to any part of Hong Kong in less than an hour from from this station using the railway network. So accessibility is super. And Hong Kong also has. Uh, and this is something I was, I was uh, on LinkedIn, I was posting to someone today, is that near the transport hubs in Hong Kong, we actually, you know, in most countries, you will see minimum parking requirement. In Hong Kong, we have maximum parking uh, provisions. So you, you close to the transport hub, you provide less number of parking. So number of parking spaces provided in a, in a development is inversely proportional to the distance they have from the transport hub. So as you go further from a transport hub, you can have more parking, but the parking is restricted around the stations. And that is to maximize the usage for good economic, economic activities, for people to live, for people to enjoy. And, and that's what makes it a fantastic proposition for people to live uh, around a transport node and then uh, you know travel anywhere they want to do for economic activities so and cycle paths as i was saying that it is coming back all over the world uh, singapore is now going through a major uh, you know drive to put in more cycle paths around the city so i'm not going to play this video but uh, i will be sharing this presentation and hopefully um, you know ceai can and uh, circulate this to everyone so you can play this video. The video is from YouTube. This is just to show how cycling is developing uh, in, in Singapore. But uh, having said that, it's very intuitive. They are doing paths, they are doing proper signages. They are also uh, putting rules where the drivers, the car drivers, they have to give way uh, to the bicyclists. So it's a priority uh, that is offered to them. And, and they want to again create a healthy city where people, for short journeys, they don't rely on motorized form of transport at all. Okay. Uh, metros, we talked about, India is already doing at 30 uh, cities, uh, you know, more than 30 cities are planning for metro at the moment. So a lot of metro development is happening, but obviously uh, we are not putting the same level of attention to the bus development. And, and I think all the cities which are doing metros, they should also, uh, you know, look at or reflect at this point that they also require a good bus system. A good bus system is is one of the first things to have, in my opinion, to to create a habit of using public transport. And once you have that habit, then metro, when it comes, it just strengthens that habit because people are used to using public transport. And and buses are more flexible; they are less expensive. So they are much easier to introduce uh, as compared to a metro system. So they, they should always, you know, and of course, when you even when you have metro system, you have this first mile, last mile connectivity issues, which can then be improved uh, using buses. India is talking a lot about electric vehicles. A lot of good things are happening, and that is really uh, fitting 
towards the transport uh, you know decarbonization agenda so a lot of emissions can be reduced if india moves towards uh, ev uh, you know electric vehicle strategy and and not just uh, on the cars or two wheelers so india is doing great job in two wheelers and three wheelers but i think we still we are quite behind others in in other areas so this is uh, you know just the countries which are doing very well versus countries that are still catching up so india is still on the catching up stage as you can see countries like china south korea they have done uh, quite a bit of advancements they have also clear targets they have set uh, on banning the internal combustion engines in those countries uh, so in china for example um, evs are <clears throat> you know almost uh, you know in in good in cities about 20% of the fleet uh when it comes to buses electric buses china is adding uh, as a country they are adding about 9500 buses every 5 weeks so they are adding one london every 5 weeks in china so these are huge numbers of of uh, fleet electrification that is happening uh, in country and of course that is all supported by uh, renewables uh, in energy generation china is now the largest a uh, renewable uh, energy producer in the world uh, india also has a huge potential india also has huge plans uh, to to generate renewables but we are running a bit behind uh, what our uh, you know five year plans had been about renewable energy generation but the potential uh, for india to to make space and make you know uh, growth in that area is is quite large so i think that those once we do those things it's quite natural that india has a very expansive very uh, um, you know aggressive uh, electric uh, electrification strategy of the of the vehicle fleet because that is going to provide at least address the tailpipe emission issue it may not address the congestion issue but at least the tailpipe emission uh, can be addressed through that measure so an, a lot of growth needs to happen in that area these are just the numbers of how many buses india is running some encouraging signs are obviously uh, coming from fame uh, scheme that the government of india has launched uh, which is giving a lot of demand based uh, uh, you know incentives to india and uh, you know it is promoting the adoption of uh, electric vehicles so just last year there were uh, there was a tender of 5000 uh, electric buses which was uh, i think one of the largest ever bus tenders in the world 5000 buses in one go and now um, the government of india is talking about having a new tender next year which is up to could be up to 50000 buses uh, and obviously uh, the the prices that that you know that kind of uh, size or scale uh, gets is is really uh, low so you know uh, and one of the best prices that i have seen uh, is about 45 rupees per kilometer uh, at full operation of those buses after subsidy of course uh, but 45 rupees uh, per kilometer if anybody can run the service like that i can tell you every single operation in indian city could be profitable you know if you look at earnings per kilometer of our bus services in india we are ranging uh, you know 50 plus you know 60 70, even up to 70 in some cities and so if you have earnings of 70 rupees per kilometer and if your cost is 45 rupees per kilometer your your the equation is right there it's a it's a profitable operation it's a it makes good business sense to do it so we need to jump on this bandwagon we need to take advantage of this opportunity and and make sure that we electrify the fleet of buses in our cities but at the same time we are also using these services so not just just converting the buses but we also make sure that we using these services and that can be done through multiple ways uh, of course we can make the bus services better then it attracts a lot of people but we can uh, provide them priority we can also Uh, restrict the use of car in certain areas there are a lot of junction priority measures or bus priority measures that can be introduced singapore for example for any road if you have more than 70 buses per hour per direction one lane of that road is dedicated for buses so this is just a planning principle and the the the, the reason for that is uh, is that 70 buses in their opinion moves the same number of people as a car as a lane uh, normal lane uh, of cars which which carries about you know 1700 1800 uh, 
cars uh, per hour uh, carries uh, you know so it's it so in terms of parity when you say you want to move people and not vehicles this moves the same number of people so that's why when you hit a 70 uh, you know vehicles 70 buses uh, per direction in any uh, road space, one lane is dedicated for bus lane. And, and it's a very simple, uh, easy to understand rule, but <clears throat> it also creates a much better uh, mobility environment within the city. So, uh, I, you know, EV policy initiatives, there are a lot happening in India. There's a lot of demand side subsidies. There's a, you know, people are converting. The take up rate is extremely high. And I, all the projections that I have seen are, are very, very encouraging when it comes to India. But obviously, um, I would have questions about charging infrastructure. I would have questions about uh, the energy in infrastructure that needs to go in there. And I think those are the areas which India, uh, you know, as a country, need to address uh, at the moment. And and also one thing which you know, I uh, this is one area where I think I have a you know I, I feel a bit disappointed if you like. So I, I also being in Hong Kong, I work very closely with China. I was involved with Shenzhen's transition to electric uh, buses uh, because my previous company, the bus company that I work for, owned 35 percent of Shenzhen bus. So we were obviously one of the stakeholders uh, in in when they were you know changing from uh, diesel bus operation to electric bus operation. So I was involved in all the trials, the the vehicle selection. Uh, the, the technology selection, et cetera, et cetera. What disappoints me, and in, in fact, in 2017, I was in Pune, I was uh, speaking on behalf of UITP at that time, and, uh, with, and something that was organized by Shakti Foundation on electric buses. And this is what I said at that time, uh, that you know, if India, with a billion people country, you know, in, the demand for buses in India is more than 100,000 buses per annum. Uh, including the replacement of the fleet and, and, and addition of the fleet. If India wants to bet on any technology, uh, you can, we can actually define what technology the world will have, because that's what China has done. Uh, battery buses were introduced in 2008 in, during Beijing Olympics. And since then, China has scaled it up, and now it has become a world standard because uh, you know it's a billion people country the technology you know the the verification the commissioning testing all that has happened there we need to probably scale up the same model uh, you know in india come up with completely new technologies and the battery technology is still evolving uh, ambani's you know the reliance has uh, in, now in, in that invested into a sodium uh, ion ba battery uh, technology in uk if that becomes successful, uh, that's really uh, going to be a transformational technology that India is going to bring to the table. Uh, other areas are, of course, using graphene-based batteries, uh, which are still a lot of work happening. Hydrogen-related, uh, hydrogen as a source of energy, that's a completely new area at the moment. Everybody is trying to solve that problem. And I think with the scale and size that India has, if all the states we align our standards. Uh, one of the problems in India is that we, we have, come, everybody is doing their own thing. There is lack of alignment. There is a lack of standardization. And you, you, you see, you know, the buses of different specifications in different cities. And then, you know, and there is no data sharing. There is hardly any uh, collective intelligence, uh, if you like. And I think that is one area where India really needs to, uh, to invest is to create this collective intelligence and build a technology platform around that collective intelligence of urban mobility that we have. We need to gather up all these data, make it either available through open APIs or make it available through, through even uh, you know, licensing or commercialization mechanism to make it work. So I won't go through this, uh, you know, EV growth story, which is a lot happening in in India, and a lot of stakeholders from all over the place, to from manufacturers to end users, everybody is uh, involved in different ways. Some are, uh, you know, traditional players who are changing. Some are completely new type of players, and some are really driving the change. So uh, uh, you know, the whole ecosystem is finally coming together to make that transition in, in Indian market. The good news is that most of the uh, you know, analysts around the world 
they also see India as one of the leaders in that EV transition. So India is supposed to have one of the highest growth rates in, in uh, electric vehicle uh, adoption uh, going forward from now. And I think that momentum can only be maintained if we have the right policies, if we create the right environment in the cities, okay? So, so these are just some numbers on EV penetration forecasts. So as you can see, uh, India is going to reach, uh, you know, some of those targets, which are expected time for the, you know, India to where the electric, electric vehicles are actually going to become um, economically more viable, uh, will be almost in, you know, 2025, 2030. That's when people would not even buy, go for, uh, you know, uh, diesel or uh, petrol vehicles or ICE vehicles, they will be buying electric vehicles naturally. But until that point, it has to be supported by either the policy measures or it should be supported by uh, financial incentives. So with that, I would uh, end my presentation and I'll hand it back to you, Ajay, for any questions that are, uh, that, you know, that you would like to ask. Thank you, thank you, Alok. Uh, fantastic, and your passionate uh, uh, knowledge, understanding of the urban transport system, <clears throat> including uh, the very rudimentary problems uh, and our uh, what you call the the traditional, uh, you know, uh, urban transportation mechanism or systems. As you rightly mentioned, that uh, you know, urban transport is a system approach. It can't be isolated and all, and that's actually which is missing in most of our cities. And we develop something, we forget everything. I remember Mr. Sridharan talked one day. He was a farewell meeting I attended. And he said, I, I still said the Mongo don't buy these large buses for the, you know, the, 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 what you call from station to commuting. Buy small buses which can carry and faster movement. And you know, a lot of things actually you can come. Somebody has realized the problem, the cities. Uh, you know, it's, it's a quite lot about the uh, the culture of cities, the people's behavior. I think Alok, that is one aspect actually uh, we quite often uh, forget, and uh, the mess around Indian footpath, uh, whether it's Cholewala, Panwala, or uh, you know Mochi, and everybody is there. They 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 occupy the entire uh, footpath. So you can't even walk to the railway station. I think those are inherent problem. I would uh, I think I can see Malsap if you are there. Uh, you, if you would like to just uh, just a uh, few questions, there are three, three, four gentlemen. I think there are some questions. Malsap, if you are there, you can uh, probably take them and uh, ask uh, Alok to you know uh, respond. Yes, I'm very much there. Dr. <laughs> sir, sir, sir. <laughs> sir, I I just leave the floor to you. I take little. I I listen so intimately, Alok. So I want to take little rest now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was also listening very intently. I mean, uh, he's given a very good perspective of the whole issue. Right. Of course, uh, India has its own problems. And I mean, even in the, within the country, each city has its own. Of course, you know, if you look at the question and answers out here, most of them are really comments and suggestions by Mr. Shyam Sundar Khandilwan. Uh, he's made very good, very pertinent points, but uh, those are really not issues which we can address out here in this event, but they can be looked at and addressed as time goes along in a different forum. It'll have to be really interaction with the transport authorities. That's what he's been su suggesting in most of his cases, hmm. suggestions rather. And there is one anonymous uh, attendee also, but they're also talking about the same thing. You know, interaction with the authorities. What happens? <coughs> most of the authorities look at a very small time frame, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And by the time the project gets implemented, that period is over. There's really a necessity for looking at much longer periods. Mr. Olof Jain just briefly mentioned hydrogen. But if you look at the comparison between electric batteries and hydrogen in the long run, 
my gut feeling is that hydrogen will be the best solution if we miss out on nuclear nuclear <laughs> yes see nobody looking at nuclear but nuclear can also be a very good source of power individually for vehicles and public transportation is no doubt going to be the best we cannot keep affording to just keep pushing in cars into the system and you'll have bumper to bumper traffic day in and day out but anyway let's open the thing to anyone who has really good questions to ask mr khandelwal we accept that what you are saying is really very valid very relevant but it will have to be addressed at in a different forum across with the authorities So there is a Maybe if we look at the last question, yeah. that's again from the anonymous attendee. It is, do you think congestion pricing should be started in some of the cities of India, but with reference to correlation with quality of mass transportation? Should there be target percentage share of mass transportation as per quality of mass transportation in various cities? Mr. Jain, would you like to take that up? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, uh, you know, this question reminds me of an interesting uh, story. Uh, I was uh, a few years ago, just before COVID, I was in in a in in a, in a country called Estonia, and I visited their capital, Tallinn. And in Tallinn, the public transport is free; all the buses are free. So that was one of the first, I would say, countries to make public free public transport. Okay, and I had the opportunity to meet the mayor. Uh, in the city, and uh, and we were just talking about this, and and he told me very interestingly, and I I said you must be losing a lot of money, and he said no, actually we are making money out of this, and I was very uh, confused. I said can you explain to me why how you can make money by running free buses, and then he explained, and he said you know when we introduced the free uh, buses, the before that, we had congestion problem. Everybody was asking me to build more roads because of the congestion issue. Because you know, they were coming to the city center was a real challenge. So they introduced a BRT system, and they made the buses free. And what they also did that they they doubled the parking charges in the downtown area. They said this was part of one package. So I increased the parking charges. And I made the gave the buses a bus lane, and at the same time made the buses free. Now people don't have any excuse to ask for free parking because I have given them the or, or cheap parking. I have given them a free bus to come into the center, which was great. But what has happened actually, and how you know they have actually made money, is that in 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 Estonia, uh, everybody every citizen uh, a tax paying citizen they pay approximately. Uh, a tax of uh, you know about 120,000 um, uh, euros or whatever, uh, or, or anybody with more than that income pays a tax. And because the public yeah. transport became free, a lot of people from countries nearby, they actually moved to live in Tallinn and they increased the population of taxpayers, you know, by extra 30 to 40,000 people, taxpayer increased in the city, attracted by the free public transport. And that extra tax that it generated paid much more money than the cost of transport you know, they had. So he says that it is actually fully paid for. And so they started with one city in Tallinn and now they have made it all across Estonia. It's actually free, free uh, transport, free public transport. So I think that's, that's a, the reason I'm telling this story is that you know, it's a carrot and stick approach. So you you can apply a, a, you know your targets on good quality public transport, and at the same time, then you can also introduce certain measures because we all know in a in a democratic country like India, uh, it could be politically sensitive to introduce a measure where you you or a draconian approach, right? In China, Singapore, these are easier to do. But in India, they could be politically difficult to do. 
But having said that, having a carrot and stick works very well. So you do one stick, but at the same time, you throw a carrot into the game. And, and I think that approach really is a uh, uh, workable approach in many cities. Right. That's, that's, uh, that's correct. Yeah. Then, sir, one uh, gentleman, somebody, I think, uh, Dhar, I think he raised his hand. Dhar, would yes, you like to are, ask something? There are three or four people raising hands. That's what I was just telling them. Yes. Please type your question in the QA box and we'll take it up. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, then it'll become free for all otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Is somebody going to ask? Just waiting. If yeah, because you know, the, yeah. there are three people who have raised their hands. If you have questions, please type them so that we can ask them. To Allah, we can put it to Allah to respond. Okay, I, I just, Mr. Khandelwal. Yeah, maybe Khandelwal want to speak, sir. Uh, let, let Sina please allow yes. Mr. Khandelwal to speak. Yeah, sure. No issues. He's yeah. given the maximum. Uh, of yeah, the yeah, but very brief because we have run out of time and uh, seven o'clock in Hong Kong and uh, you know, uh, Alok, uh, you know, he always goes for holiday dinner, so we don't want to oh. hold him up. Okay, Sa yeah. Sa Samsundar, please uh, go ahead with yeah, your good, question. Good afternoon. I would like to just speak that lot of uh, infrastructure for urban transportation, transit-oriented developments, metro, BRTs etc. have been done in India in various cities and CEI should initiate for a sort of an audit system by government of India so that uh, uh, some uh, empaneled consultants can bring out recommendations for effectiveness, safety and uh, uh, sustainable development. Like in Jaipur, I can give example, BRTS is there but not being used, uh, metro is there, no ridership because uh, reliable network planning and implementation is not there and unless network expands, door-to-door uh, -door service cannot be provided, then ridership will not come. So like that in various cities, there are some problems. So if we keep, first of all, a uh, uh, session with all the urban uh, transport authorities, wherein they present for their uh, transport, uh, whatever they have done in the urban transport, what problems they are facing, and panelists can respond in, with reference to the urban transport policy of India. And yeah. after hearing various major cities, uh, the authorities, then a revised transportation uh, recommendation can also be made and whatever expenditure. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Sam, Sam, we got your point. Actually, you wanted that, uh, you know, there is, as Alok mentioned, there is no standardization in any cities, whether it buses, roads, uh, you know, distance and various things, you know, like, uh, you know, we, we used to have Mumbai, Delhi have uh, double decker buses. They are completely out. I don't understand why the, 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 the roads which carries uh, highest number of issues and still do not have those buses. I think there are a lot of problem, uh, Sam. I think what uh, Niti Ayag's National Urban Transport Policy, which was built, uh, which was done, I think 2006, uh, I don't think that they have revised much after that. But I think uh, Niti Ayog, along with uh, Moa, Minister of Urban Housing, uh, need to really look at and, you know, uh, come out with a new urban transport policy, which cannot be like a, uh, you know, one size fit to all. It, they need to look at every city-wise based on the culture, based on the topography and various, uh, you know, land use and all. I think that to be done. I think that's not a question. We we'll take your suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Dilip, uh, Dilip, uh, Dilip Dhar, you wanted to ask something? Dilip, are you there? He is still Sina, muted. Uh, Sina, can you just make uh, make Dilip uh, unmute? We can't speak. Okay, I just uh, let me just see if I can unmute. Yeah, Dilip, you can speak now. No, Dilip. No. Not able to unmute. Sina, he can is you not there now. Oh, okay. 
okay fine fine so i don't see sir any other questions are there uh, sir uh, no there are no other questions in the question box so i yeah. had an opportunity i had a quick look at the questions ajay maybe maybe i'll okay. just quickly yeah. address some of those so yeah. there is one from uh, mr ghai uh, on uh, footpath yeah. and pedestrian interaction and uh, and mr ghai you are absolutely right uh, they 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 cannot be and and i think in the context of india they should not be separated uh, you know they are part of our street culture if you like uh, you know our not just people who who put in these shops but you know it's our uh, you know our families we 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 are used to buying our our day to day produce vegetables whatever from from the street so it is part of that uh, i i would say the you know in the cultural aspect and and yes they need to be addressed but i think what we need to do is not to displace them but we need to integrate we need to plan them in right now what is happening it's a haphazard planning people just go and it's <coughs> whoever can occupy the space either by being the first to occupy the space jo kehte na kabja anybody who does the kabja or the you know anybody who has the muscle power to push everybody out and put it put their khamba there you know uh, those but i think that approach is wrong so what we need to do is we need to bring them into the part of the planning process and then with the, as a inclusive framework integrate these activities within our urban landscape uh, alok there is uh, there is one last question from uh, mohini just if you uh, want to respond that okay what is the best mode of decongestion of indian cities given all the political economic and our people mentality etc all together i think best mode to decongest is very simple we we need to if we can impose the cost of uh, increase i think indians as we all indians are we are very sensitive to cost and if we if the cost is imposed on usage of the road space that immediately brings a certain uh, usage uh, reduction so i think the toll roads in india have done that job to some extent where uh, you know people have use it more wisely uh, and or they optimize their trips they don't use the road space indiscriminately and similarly i think if we can introduce and now the technologies exist all over the place uh and uh, you know you can you can people can pay per use and uh, many countries have also moved towards uh insurances which are mileage based insurances so people uh, you know you pay for insurance as much as you drive only based on your drive so i think that those are the kind of things the indian market need to introduce and that will incentivize people to use their car less uh you know uh, i think people will still own cars uh, to some extent but people can use less of them i think that is will also achieve a major objective right i think uh, no more questions i think uh, we are uh, absolutely uh, run out of time it's uh, now uh, time to really uh, thank uh, alok for uh, wonderful lecture and uh, you know giving your thoughts your experiences uh, uh, global experiences how you know urban transport system should work and you are a, you, you, you are actually a public transport person and uh, that's what actually that's what actually you know uh, tell us that uh, why urban transport system should work and we should do keep investing and engaging ourselves in urban transport system for for india i think the way forward is to achieve resilient and inclusive cities it is necessary to continuously plan for a low carbon model of growth growth as you rightly mentioned in our cities rather than focusing on uh, physical infrastructure for vehicle mobility alone it's a people mobility as you mentioned that should be uh, take, uh, taken into account with this i thank you all uh, for joining i thank my dear friend alok uh, for spending uh, one and a half hour time you know uh, giving his thoughts uh, knowledge understanding about public transport system uh, for showcasing some of the cities and experiences it's uh, fantastic uh, and i think um, all our members uh, they quite happy and uh, some of have already just uh, asked us to you know get in touch i think uh, you can everyone can have this slide which is now 
uh, presented the email, everything is details are there and uh, you can always write to CI. And we thank you again and thank you my colleague Malsab uh, for supporting this, uh, uh, you know, this webinar. And we'll continue to bring uh, experts, professionals like Alok to keep, uh, you know, uh, enriching uh, our understanding, knowledge of uh, our fraternity to do better consulting services and bring Indian cities to at par with what Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Dubai, and some of the new city, Neom. I think the new city is coming in Red Sea, Neom. I think we are we are 100, 100, 100 years of behind that, but we will we'll, we'll at least go to the masters and other cities. Hopefully, we'll look at it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alak. Thank you again, all of you for joining this uh, afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, and wishing you all a very happy Independence Day. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.